Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Amy Swearer. And I'm Giancarlo Conaparo. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to the show. This is SCOTUS 101 2.0. Oh, dear. Amy, is that our new introduction? You know, Giancarlo, I think now that the training wheels are off, I can do really bad Matthew McConaughey impressions. That's, Please that's don't. how this works. <laughs> Let's just stick to the SCOTUS news. Deal. I, I can get behind sticking to SCOTUS news. Today, first up in SCOTUS news, the Clarence Thomas documentary is out. It's available streaming online at pbs.org. You can watch it for free. I think that's only going to be up for this week. I could be wrong about that. But if you want to watch it, watch it soon. Interesting fun fact, it's already being reviewed on RottenTomatoes.com. The critic score is 35%. The audience score is 99%. So I think we're safe to say it's probably really good. Yeah, that is pretty uh, amazing to me that you have such a distinction between the critic score and the audience score. But personally, as someone who was in the audience and who has now watched this and rewatched the documentary, to me, there are really two things that stick out that help explain why the audience score is so high. I know for me, one of the things uh, it was more personal. I think a lot of people forget that Justice Thomas grew up in the Southern Low Country, in the marshlands of Georgia and South Carolina. So as someone who spent some of my own formative years growing up in that part of the country, it was a bit nostalgic. Uh, and, and so there was sort of a personal connection there. But second, and probably more important, I think, for people without personal connections to the low country, is that even if you don't like Justice Thomas's judicial philosophy, even if you think he's wrong about everything related to the Constitution, his story, just his story in and of itself is so compelling. It's quite literally the fulfillment of the American dream. It's abject poverty to the heights of influence and prestige. Uh, and it's this transition through hard work and education and sort of the guiding hand of providence, if you will. And you get to know the story, the person, the man, uh, because this justice often seems so much to so many people like this unknowable enigma. And you get to know him in a very intimate way as the title suggests, in his own words. And I'm not sure that anyone, even maybe his harshest critics, can walk away from this documentary not appreciating having gotten to know his life in this very intimate way. One of the things that struck me about his life is how apparently contradictory it is. If you had told me that a man who grew up speaking Geechee went to seminary, joined the Black Power movement, and then the Republican Party, I would have been really confused. But listening to Clarence Thomas explain his story and how he went through these stages of his life, there's a theme that makes this enigmatic story make perfect sense. And as he explains how each of these transitions happened, you think, well, actually, yeah, I can see how you would have gone through that transition and how a particular uh, set of experiences can lead to what otherwise seems like a very confusing narrative. And it's a, it's a remarkable story. No, absolutely. And you really do get that sense of you know, peering into this window at this, this man who just otherwise may not make a whole lot of sense to a lot of people. And, and so it is uh, highly recommended. It's still on PBS still streaming, um, at least for the next week, maybe for the next month or so, but watch it now before it's gone. Moving on to a segment that you're going to have to get used to because it's important and because I love it, the Second Amendment Watch. What is going on in the world of Second Amendment cases? So there were not any new Second Amendment grants this week, but we did see one case removed from the list of potential grants and that is Beers v. Barr. Beers v. Barr involved a challenge to federal laws that seemed to permanently ban firearms possession for anyone previously committed to a mental health facility, even if they are currently of sound mind and no longer suffer from mental health problems. 
I, I got excited for a second. I thought this was actually going to involve alcohol. No, it, it does not involve uh, beer in any capacity. Uh, the Supreme Court this week did send Beers v. Barr back to the Third Circuit with instructions to dismiss the case as moot. This wasn't too surprising because the petitioner in this case had already been granted a firearms license by his state. Now, the, the question raised by the petition is definitely an important one, and it's something the court will have to address eventually at some point in the future. But I'm not sure anyone really thought that this was the logical next step for the court in terms of building out a Second Amendment framework. And I'm not sure that anyone really thought this was going to be the case that the court would grant next. But it is one more case that has been knocked off the list of potential Second Amendment grants. In uh, the news regarding other denials, didn't, there were a lot of denials this week, and we thought we'd just highlight one of them for you. This is the Wexford Health case. The issue in Wexford is whether a prisoner who fails to comply with the Prison Litigation Reform Act of 1995's exhaustion requirement may cure that defect by filing an amended or supplemental complaint after his release. Uh, it's an interesting question that has resulted in a circuit split. Uh, why the court didn't take it up is not really clear. Justice Thomas dissented from the denial. He would have granted the petition because the court has never addressed the meaning of the relevant language. The circuit courts are split, and its resolution would have, in Thomas's words, significant ramifications not only for prisoners and prison officials, but also federal courts. In other Supreme Court news, this week, the justices temporarily blocked the disclosure of secret grand jury materials stemming from the Mueller investigation. This dispute between the DOJ and the House of Representatives goes back to last summer. A federal district court ordered the DOJ to comply with the House subpoena seeking the unredacted report, including grand jury materials the DOJ argued could not be disclosed under grand jury secrecy rules. The short version of a much more technical story is that the Supreme Court has put the release of the disputed materials on hold and told the DOJ it has until June 1st to file a petition asking the court to review the case on the merits. This suggests to some that the court may decide to take up the case on the merits before the summer recess. That brings up an interesting point that I've, that I've heard some chatter about, which is the length of the present term. As you know, we're sort of late in the game for oral arguments because coronavirus pushed that schedule back. And now we're in a situation where the court has a lot of opinions that it still hasn't issued. And we're coming up to the what is typically the end of the term, uh, late, Ju late June, July. So whether the court extends its term is yet to be seen, but we wonder how the court can produce um, all of the opinions it needs to produce by the end of the traditional calendar. Yeah, this will be sort of an interesting thing to to wait around and see sort of how long the court extends this, if it extends it. And I think that's just sort of the reality of, you know, how the court was sort of thrown for a loop with coronavirus. So it will be interesting to see. I don't know that anybody really has the answers to it, especially considering we did just end oral arguments on some of these cases last week. And, you know, looking at the date today, you're dealing with opinions that, you know, if the court sticks to its normal term, would probably be out, you know, in the next five weeks or so. And it is just sort of a quick turnaround. But I think the court did also push a number of oral arguments to next term. So it did kind of relax its caseload a little bit for this term. But it is, GC, I think your guess is as good as mine is as good as anybody else's right now for how long this term goes. Mm. Well, on the topic of opinions, we only had one this week. The case is Opati versus Sudan. The issue in that case is whether the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act applies retroactively, thereby permitting recovery of punitive damages against foreign states for terrorist activities occurring prior to the passage of the current version of the statute. So let's unpack that. We have the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which was enacted in 1996, and that allows victims and family members of victims of terrorist attacks to sue foreign governments that sponsor the terrorists responsible for the attack. So using that statute, this, the plaintiffs in this case were family members and victims of the 1998 Al-Qaeda bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. They sued Sudan for its role in supporting Al-Qaeda. 
The 1996 version of the act did not allow plaintiffs to obtain punitive damages, but a 2008 amendment, however, did allow punitive damages, and Congress made it apply retroactively to treat pre-existing lawsuits as if they had been filed under the amended statute. So the plaintiffs here amended their complaint and asked for punitive damages. They won and were awarded $10.2 billion in compensatory damages and $4.3 billion in punitives. On appeal to the D.C. Circuit, Sudan won, arguing that the statute didn't clearly apply to pre-amendment conduct. The Supreme Court said no. Really, Congress could not have been clearer in extending the 2008 amendment to existing lawsuits. So what that means is that the plaintiffs in this case get to proceed with their claim for punitive damages. Well, GC, thank you so much for that opinion summary. It is my pleasure. Okay. Look, if I don't get to do my Matthew McConaughey impressions, you don't get to do weird French accents. I cannot agree to these terms. Well, this week I was joined by Arizona Attorney General Mark Brnovich. General Brnovich is a first-generation American who has spent much of his professional career as a prosecutor at the local, state, and federal levels. Prior to being elected state attorney general in 2015, he served as a prosecutor for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, as an assistant United States attorney for the District of Arizona, and most recently, as director of the Arizona Department of Gaming. General Brnovich, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You often talk about uh, your your mother and, and her journey to the United States as an immigrant escaping the horrors of communism. Can you tell us a little bit more about her journey and the impact that it's had on your life and career? My mom, and and I'm sure everyone loves and appreciates their parents and especially our mothers and all the sacrifices they make for us. But, uh, you know, my mom, I think, is a little extra special because, you know, she's been through a lot in her life. And, And when I was growing up, sometimes I didn't always appreciate it. But even as I've gotten older, as she talks to my kids, you know, they love sitting around talking to the bub and hearing all of her stories. You know, every once in a while, randomly, she'll start telling some story about, you know, the, the fascists coming in and attacking her village. Or, you know, one day someone was in the field and there was an unexploded ordinance, one of her friends, and they, they were blown up and killed. And um, Or, you know, what happened with communism. And so, you know, you hear these spring stories sprinkled throughout her life, and yet she is everyone that knows her here in town or when she you know goes to the grocery store and walks around or the mall or wherever everyone loves her i've never heard heard her swear a day in her life uh, i wish i could do that not swear uh, so she's always had this really amazing positive attitude and i think that part of that is because she is just always taught us and we've always been raised my sisters and i with this sense of how lucky and blessed we are that no matter what's happening in life you know things could always be worse and so one of the things that I always tell my kids, you know, cause they're, you know, I was first generation, but I always try to emphasize to them that look, when, when your family has lived history, not just studied it, you have a, a great appreciation for why freedom is important to all of us, why govern, limited, limited government is important, that any government that's big enough to give you everything is big enough to take it away. And so there's all these values that kind of seep into your psyche without you realizing it. And so I am just truly blessed. And, you know, I, I just feel like I wish there was a way that I could express my appreciation more. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm very blessed to be living in the greatest country in the world with, with the land of opportunity. Yeah, that's that, that's truly incredible. Your mom was in, in Yugoslavia, sort of at the, the height of the communist takeover. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And so, like I said, she, well, both of my parents lived through, you know, World War II and, you know, and people that sometimes don't know the history of Yugoslavia, it's got this. Uh, amazing, tragic history in many ways where, you know, they, they, especially in the 19th and the 20th century, they were constantly at war. And so, you know, you look at that period where, you know, uh, at the turn of the last century where, you know, you had the first Balkan War, you had the second Balkan War, and then you had World War One. So the time World War One had hit, many people and many families in Yugoslavia had already been through three wars in the preceding, you know, generation. And so, 
um, you know, I've seen statistics where, like, for example, in Montenegro, where the Brnoviches are from, uh, 25% of the male population was killed during that period. And, you know, during World War II, outside of Poland, Yugoslavia suffered the most casualties per capita, where, you know, you had, you know, 10% of the population. And then, so after all that suffering through all those war, wars, the Balkan Wars, World War I, World War II, then you get these damn commies that take over and want to tell people how to live their lives. And so, you know, on the one hand, I think there was some folks that just welcomed the stability. But on the other hand, you know, there was obviously a lot of brewing tensions underneath that exploded when, you know, the wars of the 90s happened. I can only imagine how proud your mom must be and, and your father as, as well. Uh, but, but to see their son now as Arizona attorney general standing up and defending the principles that were so important to them uh, that, that they left their home countries uh, to come here. And now your journey from immigrant son to Arizona attorney general also had some stops along the way. So what was that journey for you? You know, I was, you know, fortunate to be raised in an environment where, you know, once it was constantly emphasized to us that what a great country this is, it's a land of opportunity, but, you know, just work hard and you do the right thing and eventually it'll work out in the end. And, you know, sometimes, you know, that arc of justice, uh, you know, bends slowly, but it ultimately bends towards the truth. And so, you know, I was very fortunate and my father died when I was younger. And so my mom had that extra burden of, you know, being the, you know, the role model for my sisters and I. And, you know, once again, this could be a good thing or a bad thing, but I was raised with three older sisters. And so, you know, in some ways I, I got a lot more attention than I probably needed, but it also talk, uh, taught me how to talk really fast and think on my feet because when you're the, the youngest and you have older sisters, you learn really quick that you got to be uh, smarter and quicker than your older sisters in order to get an edge, edge and edgewise. But I, I will tell you just one quick anecdote. And uh, when, when John McCain was still alive and he was running for re-election in 2016, I had been elected attorney general and I was doing some events with him, like kind of the opening act, you know, the, the, the opening act. Of, and so, uh, and John McCain used to say this, and, and I, I used to, I still get a tingle up my spine thinking about it, is that you know, John McCain used to say, you know, here's, thank you to our attorney general for the introduction. And, you know, think about this. You know, Marx came here, his family, he's first generation, didn't even speak English as his first language growing up. And now he is introducing, you know, me, to, you know, as your U.S. Senator, um, as the state's chief law enforcement officer. And so, you know, sometimes I take a step back and I think, oh, my God, that really is amazing. And, and that's what's so unique, what sometimes younger people, even people that have lived here a long time to understand, is that America is unique. It's not even like Europe where there's a certain aristocrats, aristocracy. Yeah, see, I, as English is not my first language, you guys know what I'm talking about. There, there's, a, there's an aristocratic class. There is a, you know, a, a certain even sometimes unwritten rules. And I, I tell folks, especially my kids all the time, that Look, I can move to Poland tomorrow and live there the rest of my life. And when I die, they would say, oh, the American that moved to Poland. You know, I could move to Japan tomorrow and work there and be a business leader. But they would always call me the American who lives in Japan. I mean, America is so unique because no matter who you are, where you come from, you can become an American. You can become part of the American dream because this country was not founded on a religion or an ethnicity. It was not founded on a certain aristocracy. It was founded on the on the notion that we are all equal under the eyes of God, and we're all entitled to life, liberty, and property. We were founded on a creed, and sometimes people don't appreciate how important that is. And that's why that's why someone like me can go from a single generation of being blessed to be born here, men not even speaking English, going to public schools, and you know, next thing you know, I'm the state's chief law enforcement officer, even arguing cases at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, absolutely, I, I'm actually feeling very patriotic right now. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you uh, walking us through that. Um, you know, were those experiences, you know, being a, a first generation immigrant. Um, were, were there part of that experience that, that led you into wanting to pursue the law, you know, per, pursuing a career as a prosecutor? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't think there's any inevitability. I was, when I was in high school, you know, I was on the debate team. In fact, I, the core group of friends I grew up with, I'm still friends with. We still hang out together. And, you know, if my wife were on this call, she would tell you that, you know, when we're together, we're all immature and we regress back to our high school years. And I, I think that we're not unique that way. But, uh, yeah, you know, so we were, I, I think part of this, not that I'm a psychologist, but I think part of that is, is it was, as I said earlier, when, you, when you're when you raised with as the youngest and you have older sisters and, you know, like I said, maybe you speak with a little bit, I spoke with a little bit of an accent, especially when I was younger. Sometimes it's, you know, there's words, sometimes still today, that are sometimes hard for me to enunciate. And I think because of that, you learn that you got to be quick on your feet. You learn that uh, you got to be sometimes a little bit witty and disarming. And you learn, especially the way I was, that, you know, you don't back down. The way I was raised is, look, if you believe in something, you know, you stand up for yourself. And it's okay to disagree with people. But as Barry Goldwater say, people can disagree, but they shouldn't be disagreeable. Uh, but I've always, I, I think that that deep love and appreciation for this country can't help but seep into the life decisions you make. And that's why even, you know, I was an army officer in the Arizona National Guard because I was always brought up that we got to get back to this country. We got to get brought back to this country. And when I became a prosecutor, I wanted to be a prosecutor. So when I was in law school, interned at the district attorney's office in California. I came out here and, you know, I became a prosecutor, gang prosecutor here in Arizona. And it was because I felt like somebody's got to stand up for people that can't stand up for themselves. And I haven't thought about this in years now that we're talking about it, but I remember when I was prosecuting gangs and I'd be talking to victims and witnesses, you know, in rough neighborhoods, rough neighborhoods that didn't want to testify, didn't want to part of the system. And I remember telling people that you got to step forward because we're going to be there. We're going to be there to help you. We're going to be there to protect you and we need your help. And at the end of the day, no one, no one in this country, uh, just because you live in a bad zip code or in a black, bad neighborhood, should have to worry about sleeping in a bathtub because of drive-by shooting or worried that you can't go to a school. And, you know, I, this is off on a little bit of a tangent. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I believe very strongly in school choice because I believe that, you know, if schools are failing, we have to provide opportunities to kids no matter where they are in order to get a great education. And to me, you know, especially as I've gotten older, I've appreciated more and more that education is the ticket to the middle class and even, you know, um, you know, wealth and prosperity and enlightenment. But it all starts making sure that, you know, in those early years, people have education opportunities. Now, now you uh, you talked about your experiences as a prosecutor. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, some of your, your favorite experiences uh, in that position and sort of how it laid the groundwork uh, for, you know, you, you, the next steps in your career? Well, you know, one of the things that you learn as a prosecutor and, you know, your job is always to do justice. And I was very, very, very fortunate that early on, um, I had some great mentors, and I remember when I was when I first started at the county attorneys, which is you know the district attorney's office here. My supervisor, who was from Chicago, and he was Slovenian, and he you know he's kind of an old school guy, and he was always you know drilling in you that no one case is ever worth your reputation, which you know really rang true to me, and always the notion that when you're the government your job is to do justice. And it's one of the things I've actually carried forward to me, even at the AG's office, when we have you know events or new employee orientation, I always tell folks that when you're the government, your job is not to win at all costs. We do not count success in terms of wins or losses or how much money you know we saved in a case. We count success in terms of have, has justice been done? And so I was very fortunate to learn those lessons, to have some really good supervisors and mentors when I was a young prosecutor that really reinforced those notions in me and it's something that I've been able to carry throughout my career and obviously here in you know our office and so you know once again not to get too into the psychology of this but you know with my background and kind of my healthy distrust of government you know, I guess some people would say it's ironic that I spent so much time in government <laughs> since I've been criticizing it for much of you know my life or career but on the other hand I understand that 
that the notion, especially the attorney general, the government is there to make sure that we have a set of rules that they are consistently, fairly, and equally applied. And that's the role of government. And that, and that's why, you know, sometimes when you see people using government to advance, you know, political agendas or personal agendas, it bothers me because it undermines people's confidence in the system. And so we ha- when we talk about equality under the law, what that means or what it should mean is that no matter who you are, where you come from, how you spell your name, how much money you have, how much money you don't have, whatever it is, your ethnic background, your race, religion, everyone gets treated the same. So if you commit this crime, you're going to be treated the same person, uh, same as any other person, no matter who you are, who you know. Now, I, I want to circle back for one second, uh, because a couple minutes ago, you, you brought up your wife who I understand actually had some recent exciting career news of her own, didn't she? Um, are you talking about my re-election? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, actually, my wife can't stand politics. No, but um, the, uh, no, yes. Um, my wife, um, who was a state Superior Court judge here in Arizona, was nominated by President Trump and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So she is a federal district judge here in Arizona. And, you know, I want, you know, we just, we just celebrated, you know, Mother's Day recently. And, you know, I had posted a picture of, you know, my mom and my family, including my wife, all of us together about 12 or 15 years ago, and then a, a recent picture. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing how much time flies. But several people comment, including my friends, that my, they're like, oh my God, Mark, uh, your wife looks like she's getting younger and you look like you're aging in dog years. <laughs> and so um, she, I, I am truly blessed and fortunate to have someone like her in my life. And, you know, once again, not sure why I, why I earned it or deserved it, uh, but uh, she's an amazing, amazing person. We, we recently uh, interviewed Jim and Allison Ho, and I, I do have to say, we, we may have to make room for a new contender for America's legal power couple. Um, so they, <laughs> they need to be on the lookout. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though. Uh, my wife, if she were here, she'd probably say, eh, she doesn't do interviews. So uh, that's all right. I'll try to make up for it. But I will tell you what, I will, this, this has been really, it's been great. And I will, I will strongly encourage her because, you know, she's got, like I said, she can talk for herself, but, you know, she's got a, an amazing, pretty interesting story as well. And, you know, even, you know, we met when we were both prosecutors and, you know, she will tell you that uh, that I we were on the same actually softball team, county attorney softball team, and then she she tells our kids how I refused to talk to her, and I would tell our kids that's because I was so intimidated by her because she was so you know good looking and smart that I was I was afraid to talk to her, but. Um, like I said, we have an interesting story. I was actually moving out of my office to move to another floor and she was taking my office and I was late and she'll always say that I'm late for everything, which I, I am. It's one of my bad habits. And so she was coming, she came into my office to try to encourage me and the sun was setting, the beautiful Arizona sun behind her and she had this angelic glow behind her and I just took the opportunity to say, hey, my friends and I are going to happy hour. Do you want to join us? And she said, sure. And then I was like, oh my goodness, like I, would, I didn't have a happy hour plan. So I called my friends from high school, um, Jacques and Mark, and I was like, oh my God, we gotta go to happy hour tonight. <laughs> and so we did, and she showed up with some of her friends, and then once again, she, the way she tells the story, um, I didn't talk to her all night. And so, <laughs> but yada, 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 it all worked out. <laughs> well, clearly it, it, it all worked out. Um, and that's, that's great to hear. Uh, I, I love that story. Um, now, General Brnovich, you, uh, circling back here, you assumed office as Attorney General in January of 2015. And by the end of the year, you were arguing your first case in front of the United States Supreme Court in Harris v. Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. Can you tell us a little bit more about that case and describe your experience sort of being thrown uh, directly into the fire on that one and, and taking that on? The the Harris case dealt with, Arizona has an, air, an air, uh, it's called the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. And this is one of those things that's kind of trendy now where, you know, where you have, you create an independent redistricting commission, which is supposedly to take the politics out of redistricting but inevitably that doesn't happen because no matter what the whatever the endeavor is it if involves politics or power politics and power will creep into it and that's exactly what happened so our case basically focused on whether the re, the 
redistricting commission had violated the U.S. Constitution when they drew the legislative district lines in 2010. Um, we basically said that, that we were alleging that the evidence had showed that they were there was a systematic population inequality in the way the district maps are drawn, and that it was done intentionally, and that it created it, it created inequalities. And so um, it was a case actually that didn't go to the appeals. It was a result of you know a, a district court decision because it dealt with redistricting went to the Supreme Court. And so I felt pretty comfortable stepping in because it wasn't as if there was people in our office that worked on the on the case, like, you know, like sometimes on a death penalty case for decades or something like that. And so, you know, I thought it was important. And if you read the transcript of that case, uh, you know, right at the very beginning, there's an exchange between uh, Justice Scalia and I, rest his soul. And um, both like and there's like that thing in the transcript where it says laughter so we kind of like there's a little banter between him and i back and forth which um was great because kind of put me at ease and, and the two things i remember about that case going into it was one is i had seen other cases argued at the u.s supreme court in fact one of my good friends who's on the arizona supreme court justice clint bullock that he had argued the grand home v healed case i had filed an amicus brief on that case when i was at the goldwater institute and so you know i had seen clint argue that and you know win that case and i had seen other people argue as well over the years and i just remember thinking to myself like you know this is no different than arguing, you know, some drive by shooting case in front of a jury, you know, you got to be prepared, you got to be comfortable and, you know, you know, be ready for questions. But, you know, to me, it wasn't that intimidating, so to speak. And so I saw other people that were that had argued dozens of cases. And I remember thinking, oh, they, they're not that good. I mean, I could, do, you know, do a better job. And so the one is you always have that in the back of your mind. And then the, the second part about that case that always stands out to me is that, you know, everyone I know that had practiced or argued cases said, oh, you're going to you're going to talk for about 30 seconds. They're going to interrupt you. So don't worry about it. Just have about a minute of stuff written down and then just expect all the questions. And then when you prep, you're going through all these variations of questions and everything. So I start talking and I've literally got about 45 seconds or 30 seconds worth of stuff, you know, like to say <laughs> no one's interrupting me. So I'm like, oh my God. So I had like make up stuff. So I'm like, had to, you know, make kind of make up stuff there on the fly. And, uh, but yeah, anyway, it, uh, it, it was, you know, as, as, a, as a lawyer, you know, being able to do that was, was pretty neat as I look back on it. But the reality is going into it at the time, you know, yeah, I would recently been reelected. There was a lot of stuff going on and, you know, I, you have to prep for it. Like, like it's a trial or any other big case. And so it was almost as if I didn't, I wish I had appreciated the moment even more. And in fact, a, a little bit of trivia once again is that, um, I was actually, I, I love to drink coffee in the morning. And this is a habit I picked up when our kids were born, you started drinking coffee. And so, before the argument, I was like, I had to go to the court. And I told our folks, I'm going to, I'll go meet you at the Dunkin' Donuts. I underestimated the traffic in, in DC. So I could, I couldn't make a Dunkin' Donuts. And they met, you know, my chief of staff met me out front and we're like, we need to get in. We need to get in. And so someone had said, you got to report to the marshal's office and you got to go here, the clerk. And so it's, you know, you're supposed to check in by like nine o'clock. And it's like nine or five, and I'm like, oh my God, I hope they let me argue this, you know? And so I'm like running around, scrambling around, and then like someone from the, the marshal's office or whatever is like, hey, don't sweat it, man. They tell people that, like, and then they take you to like the lawyer's lounge, and you're in there. And, you know, the first thing I do when I sit down, you're in there, I was like, oh my gosh, we need to get ourselves a coffee. And so you go to the Supreme Court cafeteria, and everyone's like, do you guys have like any latte or anything? They're like, or espresso, and they're like, no, man, we got coffee. And so, you know, whatever, <laughs> it's over there. And so I, I got a, a, a cup of coffee and threw some milk in it and tried to make myself a homemade latte. And, and then, you know, you go in, and next thing you know, it's over and done with. And now you, you've actually been on the front lines of, of several high-profile legal battles in recent years, including uh, voter fraud and consumer fraud, uh, like the infamous Theranos case. But a couple of years ago, I understand that it actually hit a little close to home with your mother falling victim to an instance of voter fraud. So can you tell us a little bit more about what happened there? Yeah, the, the kind of short Reader's Digest version is someone was trying to qualify for state office and they had apparently, well, not apparently, the, 
courted and thrown off the ballot because they had had forged signatures on their petition forms. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, they're going through the forged signatures and you know, one of them is my mom's. And it was really kind of funny because it's like, you know, if you're going to forge someone's signature, should you, for, should you <laughs> forge the attorney general's mother's signature? I mean, so it wasn't exactly, you know, a good move on their part. But, uh, you know, I, I did tell our folks afterwards that, gosh, we got to really work on my name ID because apparently no one knows I'm the <laughs> They're forging my mother's signature. Your office has also been uh, very heavily invested in anti-human trafficking efforts. Uh, why are these efforts so important and what's currently being done in Arizona to combat this? The reason why it's important, it goes back to these fundamental principles of we have to protect the most vulnerable people in our society. We have to be there for people that can't stand up for themselves. I mean, there are plenty of people, you know, you know, corporate titans that can, you know, take care of themselves. But when you hear or when you see these cases or you go to a shelter, you know, that I've been to where you see 14, 15 year old kids, boys, girls, you know, those are someone's, not only their son or daughter, someone's niece, nephew, someone's friends, family member. And, and you think about what happened to them and the way they were exploited and they don't have that opportunity to, you know, defend themselves and fight back. It is something that all of us have an obligation to, to do to protect them. And I think, and I, and I said this when I was running, that as a society, we ultimately, you know, when we're dead and gone, people will look back and they will judge us on how we treated the least vulnerable amongst us. What did we do to protect those that couldn't protect themselves? And so when I became AG, I actually hired from the county attorney's office, you know, the, district, the district attorney's office, the former prosecutor of the year whose specialty was going after the degenerates that took advantage of our kids that committed crimes against children. And so we really ramped up that division. Um, since I've been AG, we've actually prosecuted more than 250 cases that are connected to uh, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, um, illegal enterprises related to the exploitation of minors. We've worked with the local police departments to conduct sting operations and uh, arrest these degenerates that you know are trying to you know exploit our kids. We have a, an Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. We also work with local officials to go after people that are exploiting kids, you know, on the Internet or in, you know, films. And so it's something that we have taken a very aggressive stance from a prosecutor standpoint. But also one of the things that I wanted to do is to institute training programs. And so Cyber AG, we have a community outreach group that has created booklets and pamphlets to go out to, to high schools and to civic groups and to let them know, like, here's the danger signs, here's the warning signs. You know, we have, to, and, and right now with everything going on, we have to especially be careful with, you know, kids getting groomed because they're spending so much more time on the internet and, you know, the, the pedophiles, you know, are out there trying to take advantage of them. So we need to fight back against that, push back that against that and hold those accountable that are, exploiting the most vulnerable people in our society. Yeah, now, you, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the risks of, you know, kids being on the Internet more often. Uh, is there any sense in which uh, coronavirus and, and schools being shut down um, and, and kids spending more time at home, is there any sense in which that might be impacting uh, human trafficking and, and making it easier or harder for, for these uh, guys to, to commit these horrific crimes? Well, you know, there's no like statistical, like hard data on that right now. But I do think anecdotally that as kids spend more time on the Internet, they're spending less time at school, they're spending more time cooped up. So that means they are interacting or they can interact more with people they don't know online. They're making you know, quote unquote, new friends. And so I think those that's always problematic. And it's one of the reasons why as parents, you got to be careful and you got to monitor what your kids are doing online, you know, who they're talking to and what chat rooms they're in, uh, you know, because, you know, there are a lot of, I mean, negative influence, influence, influences out there. And so I think it's something that we all need to obviously be careful and, 
you know, concern with. And the other thing, you know, is related to that, not related directly to the issue of kids, but related to being, you know, cooped up with Corona and people online is that, you know, I also worry about mental health issues related to this and, you know, the impact it's going to have, you know, in a, and I hate to use the word normal year, but, you know, in a, in a typical year, you know, there's about 48,000 suicides in this country. And I worry with, the social distancing, the people are social isolating. And then maybe they're online and they see all these terrible stories and it has a uh, impact on their mental health. And I worry that we're gonna see, you know, consequences maybe in the short term, even long term of, you know, mental health issues and especially suicide. So that's something we all need to be cognizant of. We as a society need to be aware of. We need to make sure that, you know, just a reminder that, you know, whether it's friends or whether it's family, whether it's, you know, your neighbor, you know, remind people that someone cares about them. And, you know, even if they're not loved, they're at least liked. That is that is a great reminder because there really is no escaping the all-consuming headline that is coronavirus right now. Um, could you actually explain a little bit uh, about what's going on in Arizona and, and how the state is trying to balance public safety with individual liberty uh, in this uh, epidemic crisis? Well, the governor is, you know, has issued several executive orders and we have gotten requests. You know, one of the things that we can do when you have a, a legislature ask for an opinion, we have issued several opinions related to the coronavirus outbreak and what to do. And one of the big things that we did, we have an opinion that's available on our website. We've actually created a special page on our website that people can go to azag.gov. And you can look at the latest updates on Corona, what we're doing, whether it's going after scammers, the crooks, the con artists, they're taking advantage of this. But the other thing we did is we issued a, a formal opinion. And, and, you know, literally, you know, the, the, the gist of it is, is that, you know, just because we have a pandemic or this crisis, um, we need to make sure that we are going back to our fundamental principles and that we need to remember that, you know, the consti constitutions are created to secure individual rights. And we basically interpreted the governor's executive order, uh, we believe obviously properly, that it excluded constitutionally protected activities because going to church um, is essentially an essential activity and that there are constitutional protections that supersede state statutes when it comes to our ability to uh, practice our religion and assemble for church services. General Brnovich, I really appreciate all the time you've spent uh, with the program today uh, talking with us about your life and, and career and what's going on in Arizona. As a final well, question that we like to ask all of our guests, if you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would it be and what would you talk about? Well, I will tell you what, I'm a little bit... Spoiled. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, rest his soul, I love Justice Scalia. And I was fortunate enough to have met him several times. And just a quick story, I remember um, I had introduced him at an event here shortly before he died. And I remember I, I said, Justice Scalia, how do you want me to introduce you? What do you want me to say? You know, you've done all these amazing things. You've the books, Court of Appeals, Law Professor, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, you know, in that kind of gravelly voice, like, Mark, have you ever heard the president of the United States introduced? And I said, yeah, why? And he goes, well, when they introduce the president, they say, here he is, the president of the United States. He goes, I have found in life that the more important your job, the shorter the introduction. So all you need to say is, here he is, Justice Scalia. And of course, that's a great story. And then the first thing he did is he actually got up and he, he made a joke and he said, you know, what's the deal with this Burnovich guy? He goes, um, you know, uh, why can't he have an, an, an American sounding name like Scalia? You know, so he made a, a joke about my last name. And so I was fortunate enough to have met him a couple of times and be in conversations with them. And so that, that's something that I, that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And I guess if you, you know, once you take justice out of the, the equation, I don't know if this would be, you know, cliche ish, but, you know, justice Marshall, I think, you know, um, you know, maybe, you know, someone from the original court, just to get a sense that you could talk about like, Hey, so what was, um, George Washington like, you know, hey, how bad was the rivalry between, you know, Jefferson and Adams or whatever, you know, just just to be able to like pick their brain, not only on court stuff, but just on the on the history and the founding. And, you know, I, I, I we've I know we've talked about this 
about the history of this country and how great it is, but it really is amazing when you think back on what the framers of our Constitution did. They were willing to risk their lives, and people forget about this. I mean, they were committing treason when they revolted against the British Empire. And then to create a government and a document that's supposed to be where, where government's limited and there's all these checks and balances, I mean, it is absolutely amazing when you think about, um, you know, in that context of, you know, what, what they were able to accomplish and the fact that they didn't create a monarchy or a dictatorship, the fact that they were willing to disperse power and create a public republic, excuse me. Um, it, it just really is uh, absolutely amazing. Well, General, uh, as I said, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You've, you've been an absolute pleasure to, to talk with. Um, and uh, we would look forward to having you back again or, or having your wife on, having you both on. Uh, shameless, <laughs> shameless plug for, for future interviews. Yes. Uh, but, but thank you so much. General Brnovich was gracious enough to stick around and try his hand at trivia. We promised him we wouldn't play Stump the Chump, but as you will see, General Brnovich isn't likely to be stumped by much when it comes to Arizona-related SCOTUS trivia. General Brnovich, we have five trivia questions for you today, and your theme is Arizona and the Supreme Court. Are you ready for this? Oh, I hope so. And, you know, I don't have my phone with me, so I'm not going to be able to uh, look up answers or cheat. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Question number one. What famous 1966 Warren Court decision involving the police began in Arizona? Okay, that's a really easy question. It's the, the Miranda case, uh, Miranda v. Arizona. And the interesting thing about that was I know when I was started as a young prosecutor, I knew detectives or people on the Phoenix Police Department that were involved in that case. And he had actually committed you know, other crimes you know, before he was arrested. And my recollection is off the top of my head that Miranda, even though his conviction got overturned, he ended up dying a few years later um, in a knife fight. So, so we did start off with a, a fairly easy warm up question, a little softball question for you. Uh, well, I hope but, I'm right on that knife fight stuff. <laughs> <laughs> quest, question number two. What was the vote in that case? Bonus points if you can tell me who wrote the majority opinion. <laughs> well, let's see. It was the um, Earl Warren Court. It was a 5-4 decision. And I'm going to guess because it was 5-4 that Warren uh, wrote the opinion for the court. You are now two for two. So it was. It was a 5-4 decision. And the majority opinion was authored by Chief Justice Warren and joined by Justices Black Douglas, Brennan, and Fortas. And I'm sure that your listeners or many of your listeners will know that, you know, the story always was is that Earl Warren, he was the governor of California, and that Eisenhower appointed him to U.S. Supreme Court because he wanted to get rid of a political rival. So, um, and, and Eisenhower, I think, famously said that putting Warren on the court was one of the worst decisions he ever made in his life. And if he didn't say it, he should have said it. So you're not, you're batting a thousand so far. Moving on to question right, well, three. It's, it's not just about batting a thousand. It's like Reggie Jackson. Uh, some of your younger listeners may not remember that. It's not only about hitting the home run. It's about hitting the home run with style and flair. Yeah. So. <laughs> Which Supreme Court justice served in the Arizona Senate and as a judge on the Arizona Court of Appeals? Sandra Day O'Connor. And once again, I'm very fortunate to have met Justice O'Connor. I've had dinner with her and she's obviously an Arizona legend. And I tell our young lawyers in this office that I didn't always agree with Justice O'Connor and what she wrote, but if you ever want to read a, uh, a great dissent, you know, we all talk about Justice Scalia and his, some of his dissents and the book Scalia dissents, but Justice O'Connor's dissent in the Kelo case dealing with eminent domain and the violation of our property rights is great. I love that. I, it's one of the best dissents ever written, I think. And she really gets down to the nut on how important property rights are. Uh, so, yes. Final answer, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. That, that is correct. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor was the first female majority leader of a state Senate and prior to beginning her judicial career was also Assistant Attorney General of Arizona. Speaking yeah, of... And if you, so go, go ahead. 
No, I hate to keep dropping all this knowledge on you guys, but um, it, 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 one of the things about Justice O'Connor talked about at, and she's talked about this in this even in her book, is that when she graduated, she graduated from Stanford Law School. She actually couldn't find a job here in Arizona. And, you know, they tried to, you know, she, they offered her jobs as a secretary. But that was one of the reasons why she went into work, the government work, was because the, the government was willing to hire her as a lawyer. So speaking of Sandra Day O'Connor and her books, she wrote a book about her formative years growing up on a ranch. What was Lazy the name? Oh. You could, couldn't, even, couldn't even get the question out and you got the answer. Uh, yeah, the, the, Sorry. What, what was the name of that ranch? What is the Lazy Bee? The Lazy Bee Ranch, yes. It's a great book. I've read it. Uh, it is. It is the Lazy Bee Ranch, and O'Connor and her brother Alan co-wrote the 2003 book, Lazy Bee, Growing Up on a Cattle Ranch in the American Southwest. So thus far, my, my questions have proved uh, fairly easy for you, but we've got one more left. So let's, let's see if you can bat a uh, 1,000 all the way through. The last question, which Supreme Court justice went to law school with Sandra Day O'Connor, practiced law for many years in Phoenix, and once proposed to her? William Rehnquist. That is Justice correct. Lane. Yeah. Chief Justice William Rehnquist uh, and O'Connor both attended Stanford Law School and served on the Stanford Law Review and dated in 1950. O'Connor ultimately declined Rehnquist's proposal and instead in 1952 married John J. O'Connor III at the Lazy Bee Cattle Ranch. The General Burnham And the rest is history. You, you, you did great today. Thank you so much for indulging us in, in some trivia questions. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, I love competition. I feel like we should almost do another five, but uh, I guess uh, maybe we should, do, we should challenge a, uh, you know, I don't know, somebody on the Supreme Court to the contest. So uh, <laughs> I'm ready. Well, well, we'll have to make sure that if we have you back, we, uh, we get some tougher questions for you. Oh, no, don't ask you tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> But remember, even Reggie Jackson strikes out every once in a while. <laughs> well, you were certainly the, the Reggie Jackson of trivia today. That was, again, Arizona Attorney General Mark Brnovich, who I, I must say is just one of the most gracious and kind-hearted people I've ever had the pleasure of speaking with. He's one of those people where just within 30 seconds or so of chatting with him, he just puts you at ease just with his, his gracious demeanor. So we really appreciate uh, having him on and, and certainly hope to have him back. Amy, I noticed you called him General Brnovich, and that brings me into a debate that I want to invite our listeners into. Oh, Why no. do we call attorneys oh, general and solicitors general general? General is an adjective. And All yet the right, Supreme- folks, that's our show. I, wait a minute, I'm not done. Thanks for listening to SCOTUS 101. I have a lot of rant coming here. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please, if you love us, be sure to leave us a five-star rating. Well, if you would like to continue this fight with me, you can do so on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS101 and email us at SCOTUS101 at heritage.org with your questions, comments, or ideas for future shows. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Amy Swear and Giancarlo Canaparo. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, Mark Guiney, and John Pop. For more information, visit heritage.org.